Uh, we've got several topics, which I'll just go over quickly so everyone's aware. We've got uh, questions about daily funding and construction. We've got questions about urea and distribution, uh, the share register and in institutional investors, the technology involved, the indigenous and environmental and COVID, and other parts of Lee Creek business. So uh, without wasting any time, Justin, we'll delve right into the daily funding and construction. Uh, Day Lim, who are they? Are they big? Uh, and what do they know about fertiliser? Um, if, if you look at them, you can do your own web searches on it, and I'm sure people have. If you have a look at Dalim, they are one of the 10, in the top 10 largest EPC construction companies in the world. Um, and if I think it's on page 16 or 17, there's a um, map of where Dalim are actually working at the moment, and it's pretty extensive. They're in Russia, Saudi Arabia, China, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore. You have a look at that map, and there's two important ones within there. The Saudi Arabia one with Aramco and their partners, they're actually building an ammonia plant. That's the front end for us, remember, that we go from ammonia to urea, and with Eurochem. Eurochem is a fertiliser producer in Russia, um, and Eurochem are getting theirs constructed, constructed sorry, by Dalim. So the company's huge. The, the ability, it, was, it is quite bizarre. We, we got asked a question that someone said that they didn't believe that Lee Creek had the capability or the skill set within the company to be able to build an ammonia plant, urea plant. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly why we employed Dalim, someone who has done it before. And if you look at the names on that particular sheet and do your own work on it, you'll see that they are dealing with the largest companies in the world. They're not dealing with the minnows. And it's a great compliment to us that this company sat down and did their due diligence with us for months and went through the process and came back and said, they want to be part of the major project. They don't want to be doing the BFS. They don't want to be doing the feed if they're not part of the major project. They can't commit their resources to it. And they have over 170 people working for them on this project. They would not be doing that just for the feed or the BFS. So, the fact that they came in with us was a great compliment to us. It took a lot of work. This was not a 10 minute sign up. We worked very, very hard with them to go through all the issues, gas quality, licensing, environmental. Environmental was a major issue to these guys. Um, and they had made it very clear from day one that they want to partner with us in this project. And we're working with them on a whole range of issues, which I'll deal with in one of the other questions a bit later. Thanks, Can I just add? Can I just add to that, uh, everyone? Uh, Daylim has been operating since just after the Second World War. They're in, or have been in 35 countries and completed 600 projects. The project that Justin referred to in Saudi Arabia, the ammonia plant there, is 100 times larger than our site, uh, our project at Lee Creek. So can they do it? Yes, they can do it. Thanks, Thanks, Tony. Um, now with daily with financing, uh, we've mentioned that they're going to provide 70% of the funding from Korean banking institutions. Uh, are there other funding alternatives you're looking at, potentially on better terms uh, or offering more debt rather than just the 70%? And the just the 70% debt is not a small component, by the way. That's a pretty decent number. Um, try getting without mortgage insurance, try and get more than 70% on an LVR on your home. It's not easy to do. Um, however, no, we're not locked in. We, if we can obtain funding elsewhere, then we have the option or the alternative. Daily won't care. If they have the EPCC contract, then they're constructing commissioning. Um, the fact of the matter is that it's a bank that will be providing the funding from their end. So they're not making a profit out of that funding. So it makes no difference to them whatsoever. Um, we looked at a project previously where it was a billion dollars and we were able to raise that both in primary debt and in mezzanine finance and an offtake in there as well, which we'll come to as well. So there are different alternatives there for us. We're not locked in. Okay, great. Um, obviously, you're not going to draw down all the money straight away, but when you do start drawing it down uh, as you're completing the build, how does that work with interest payments and how do the drawdowns work? It'll depend on which way we go. Um, with both of them, the actual interest payments are deferred. So either way, it'll, it'll go through until there's production. So we won't have to actually meet the interest rates. 
Um, on the drawdown, if we go down the dale impath on the 70%, if you think about that, it's no different than a house mortgage. It's no different than gradual drawdowns. The, the Korean bank will not be giving us the money. The Korean bank will be giving dale the money as they construct the plant. Um, and you know, you'll end up with parts of that that you owe on. However, the whole package is being deferred until we get to production. Okay. We keep hearing these Korean banking name, or we haven't heard the name. Can you give us the name of the Korean institutions or no, is that hush hush? No, it's confidential. Um, okay. But, but um, certainly as we get closer and once we get through the, the process with FID, which means your BFS has been done, um, then subject to FID, I'm sure we'll actually be able to announce to the bank. That won't be a problem. Okay, that's 70%, which is huge. You've obviously got in place. Uh, where do you see the other 30% coming from? Uh, the market cap at the moment certainly doesn't suggest that uh, it can happen or you can get the 30%, which I certainly don't agree with. 30% is not difficult to get. The first 70 is always the hardest, but the 30% is not difficult. Very clearly, one of the ways you can do it is equity, right? That is, you know, we issue the shares. Um, that's probably the least attractive possible way we could ever do it at current share price. And it's silly. You know, if you have to raise three or 400 million or $500 million um, to complete that gap, and if you look at your market cap, the dilution is just too big. So, but, but, you know, hopefully the share price won't be anywhere near that when we actually get to this point of making the choice. However, there are other ways we can do it. You can do mezzanine finance and take debt. We have, as I said, an offer on the table for that. We have an offer on the table for project sell down. And that is that rather than investing in Lee Creek, the company, that they buy into the actual urea ammonia plant. So that if they buy into 30%, they'll get 30% of the um, urea, right? But that will actually cost more than the 30%. So we'll make money out of that sell down. But there's an offer on the table for that at the moment. Um, COVID makes it difficult, I might add, because you have to do all this through Zoom or through Teams, and it's not a good way to do business internationally. Um, however, you know, we'll work through that. Uh, and then, of course, there's an offtake. And if you have a bankable offtake, the old way that everyone used to do it was if your project had a bankable offtake, you'd fund against that offtake agreement. If it was a take or pay and it was locked in, the banks would lend against that. We do have that as an option. Um, we have, I can say very clearly, we have two offtake offers for the full amount of our urea. Um, However, off-takes aren't always the best way to go. It is an option we can, we can go down and explore, but it's not always the best way. And, and I want to give an example of something that happened to Lee Creek. And it was mentioned very early on in about 2016 when we first started the company. And we we're talking about off-takes for our gas. We were offered an off-take agreement by one of Australia's largest gas companies for all of our gas. And it was $6 a gigajoule. There was a collar and cuff. There was slight um, formula variations on it, but it was $6 a gigajoule. Now, you think about that. If, we were, if we'd signed that contract in 2016, we would be selling gas today, or when, next year, at the end of the year, when we get into that production then, we would be selling gas at $6 a gigajoule. And that company would be selling it at between eight and ten dollars on its long-term contract, so its spot market at twenty dollars, and that difference is massive for us. If you think about that, if we're doing sixty PJs, right at six dollars, that's three hundred and sixty million. If we're selling that today in today's market, that's six hundred million dollars a year in revenue. Right, so we were tempted. I can assure you, we were tempted in signing that agreement. We were a small company. We had a market cap back then of about $20 million, $15 million. Um, you would get this wonderful short-term spike in your share price, and then you're locked into that price. So an offtake isn't always the best way to go. That is not an excuse, guys. That is not an excuse that says we don't want to do an offtake or we can't do an offtake. That is not true. But we have to choose the right offtake. And the only reason we would do an offtake agreement is if we couldn't fund the 30% in other ways, or it was a strategic group that came in on that offtake agreement. Okay, thank you. Um, for stage one, if we don't get the share price above 28 cents, do you have, and we don't get that 28 million coming into Lee Creek, do you have any alternative methods of funding 
for that? We have to work um, well ahead of the curve on this sort of stuff, guys. Um, of course we do. We have two other ways. I mean, we can sell part of the project. If we're selling into part of the project, that includes stage one. We can fund anything we need to right through to actual um, operation and commercial development. Um, so, and that's a discussion that's happening right now. So we do have an alternative there. Um, and debt funding is also on the table for the same thing, for anything we need to get us through to production. So we have two others as well. Um, we don't have to go down that 28 cent option path. Um, however, you know, 28 cents is not a bad price at the moment. That's good. Uh, do you have any financial support from the government for the project? Uh, one of the questions we got, I get quite often, is the grants question. And look, let's be honest, guys. I would love a grant. Who wouldn't want money from the government for free? You know, they're always tied. There are strings attached to them. But you know, normally it's one for one spending. Anyone would want that sort of funding. That's fine. The big boys are the ones that seem to get it. Um, we have applied for numerous grants and have been shortlisted on a couple of occasions. On one occasion, we're advised that we were successful and then we announced that we weren't even on the list. And the companies they gave it to, by the way, um, did not succeed in what their grants were for. It, um, I think there's several reasons for that. I think on the east coast of Australia, I think there's a, a bit of a scare for governments to be involved in ISG or UCG and be seen to be supporting that. I think because it's perceived as a fossil fuel, that unless it's the CCS, which I'll get into in a minute, the ability to get grants or substantial grants is actually quite difficult. But I think if you go down the CCS path, um, and we've had several meetings with the relevant federal ministers over this in the last two months, um, and have meetings scheduled coming up very soon as well, I think that that's the best chance we have for any sort of a government financial support is through a CCS program, where we can actually demonstrate we can do CCS. I think that's our most likely one. I think the chances of that, and I, I'm not saying whether it should be a Liberal or Labor government, but I think the chances of a fossil fuel company ever getting a, a grant from the federal government would be quite difficult, um, but, but we'll keep applying for it. Oh, the other thing too on that point is we have not relied on internal expertise for these government grant applications. We've actually employed some of the best consultants in Australia whose whole and sole job is to do government grant applications. So we haven't relied on our own expertise. We've actually gone through a process. I mean, I said shortlisted, but haven't received one. Okay. What? Thank you. What quality controls do you consider appropriate on the contractor? Uh, well, we're part of the team. It's not just that it's an EPC because there's a funding component in there and there's actually, we didn't want it to go down construction only. We wanted to go down commissioning and, and, also operating at the end for a period of time for a handover. So the first side of that was we were very comfortable with their expertise. We knew what they could do. We are part of that team and we have a management team and committee of which we um, are part of. And we have our own consultants that are experts in their field that are also part of our team. Um, it's a straight um, EPC contract that has checks and balances in there. We had out of interest, we had our own legal um, team working on it externally when we did the contracts and then we had that independently reviewed. The board required that not only do we have our legal team work on it but it was independently reviewed by a third party with experience in these contracts to make sure that our rights were protected um, and it passed with flying colours and Dalem have been very responsive to any of our issues. So I'm not overly concerned about that. It sort of leads into one of the other questions there was that you know do we have the expertise on the board to keep a control on that? I can assure you we're looking at that. That is something that um, I don't want to rush into because there are several alternatives. Do you look at a board member who has expertise in infrastructure builds? Do you look at a board member who has expertise in fertiliser? Um, and I can assure you that I've interviewed several parties in each of those areas um, and we're not going to be rushed into a decision, but certainly before we actually get to that construction phase, we're going to need a stronger board within this area. It's good to see that planning. Uh, I think everyone wants to know the answer to this one. This is the most uh, common question that's been asked over the last couple of months, weeks. Uh, is there an offtake coming soon? Um, if we want. <laughs> it, really, <laughs> it, it sounds bizarre. Everyone would sit back and go, 
oh, if someone's throwing an offtake, and I go, the reasons I gave before, if someone's, you know, put an offtake agreement in front of you, surely you would take that. Um, the, the answer is no. It's not surely we would take it. Um, we're negotiating, and we have been negotiating for quite a while with several of them. One of them we have to get overseas and negotiate and, and discuss, and we're not signing anything until we've actually met and gone through with all parties to see which one's the best one for us. Um, but I, we could sign one tomorrow if we wanted to. Uh, back onto Dalium again. I noticed the announcement this morning. Things were starting to kick off, which brings me to this question. Uh, we've got COVID obviously rampant in Australia at the moment. Is it? It's, is that creating any difficulties with getting started on stage two? Um, well, from a logistics point of view, it creates one difficulty, and that is that the people they bring down have to go into quarantine. Um, so we work with the government. We're working with the government departments and the South Australian government um, have been very proactive on this in the quarantine requirements we're going to have when we bring people down from Korea to start working in this building. Um, as I said, they've got 170 people working on it already. They will be bringing quite a few down to Adelaide. Um, and also, they're going through an employment process with Australian engineers right now. There have been ads, there have been interviews taken on that. So we will have Australian engineers working on the project. Um, they'll be working in Adelaide too with the Dalian team. So that kicked off properly this morning. They met one of their first milestones that we announced. Um, there's another milestone we'll announce fairly soon that they are very close to meeting and we're just going to keep working one step through on the process. Not very sexy, I might add. And each one of those is just another tick that we move through on that checklist. Uh, but these guys are serious. They're not mucking around and they're quite happy to go into 14 days quarantine, something I wouldn't be happy doing. Um, but for the sake of the project, they're going to do it. No, well, I've seen, I understand, we've seen the CCADs as well. So it's definitely moving forward. They're, they're advertising. Uh, trying to acquire, so that's all very good. Uh, we're moving on to the next section now, which is urea and distribution. Um, one thing with, obviously, the spot price or the retail price, they're two very different prices there. Have Lee Creek looked into setting up their own distribution network to take on Instatec Pivot? Uh, is this something that could be done with the assistance of Dalim? Um, the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> That's the short one. The longer one is it doesn't cost a huge amount to set up the actual physical facilities for distribution. You know, you can set up one in Adelaide, one in Brisbane, one in Victoria. You probably wouldn't look at the Western Australian market, um, but if you looked at the other markets, it wouldn't be difficult to do that. And it wouldn't cost a huge amount of money. Um, but then you're going into competition not just with um, IPL, but you're going to competition with anyone else who sells within Australia. We know from a price point of view, we just can't get beat. No one can compete with us on price. So we have to look and have looked at whether we set up our own distribution um, or whether we end up selling you know, through the current uh, retailers that are out there. Um, one's a lot easier, going through the current retailers is a lot easier, but going through our own distribution arm actually gives us more profit. Um, so for a little bit of money up front and hard work, we actually get a better return by distributing it ourselves. And we're having a look at several options in there. There are a couple of innovative ways of doing that. Um, there are a couple of very, very large um, internet providers now in Australia that are farm-based or cooperative-based that source lots of their different products, vehicles, trucks, fencing, fertiliser, grain through this process. And that's not an expensive one. We've been approached by two of them uh, to come in with them and provide um, product through their particular uh, marketing group. Um, and they take a very, very small percentage of whatever goes through that particular site. So we are looking at it. Um, and um, we're looking at it, not just doing it on our own, but with someone else who has expertise in this area as well. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier that China's stopping exporting of urea or fertilizer. Have you been speaking with the government on a federal level the importance of urea production domestically uh, to keep our, I guess, Australia's supply chain secure? It's anyone who knows farming um, knows just how important urea is. Um, I've got a son in law with a property uh, with wheat and barley. And you know, I remember years ago asking him a simple question how important was urea to his production? Um, and his comment to me was he wouldn't be fine, it wouldn't be financially viable for him 
to plant barley and wheat without actually having urea. And it's a huge cost factor for him and for all farmers that have to actually go and buy urea. I think that COVID has given everyone a wake up call in a few areas, and that is on the supply chain side. It's getting very difficult now to get products into Australia. There are um, issues everywhere on that supply chain line. But I also think that, um, you know, you, you see, I think the China one, I don't think it was urea. I think China was phosphate that they'd stopped. China doesn't export a lot of urea into Australia, but it does show the vulnerability that we have as a country without having that production within Australia itself. Um, so the messages we get from the politicians and from the Farmers Federation, from grain growers, and everyone else is that they are incredibly supportive of it. And it's interesting that we've focused now that message on fertiliser and we're getting a very different response. And I'll deal with that a bit later on in one of the questions as well. So you just touched on that there. You've been speaking with the Farmers Federation. You've been in contact with farmers. I mean, I, I noticed, I listened to it on Monday morning, you did a podcast with the farmers group. Uh, it looks like you're currently starting to engage with them Matt, to get obviously Lee Creek brands out there for the future. Yeah, it's, it's a balancing act. Um, and the reason I say that is if you go too early to meet with these particular groups, you're saying, I think one of the questions I was asked is, is it a pipe dream? Um, you know, <laughs> if you go too early, they say to you, okay, so when are you going to be producing? So if we'd gone to the farmers groups back in 2016 or 17 and said, we're not going to be producing, you know, until 2022, 23, their eyes would glaze over. Right, and then you know they go into the analytics. They they do what most of the fund managers would do. They look at the cost. They look at the size of the company, and they go, okay, it's a pipe dream. What happens is as you tick the boxes, as you move through each of those issues, and you get to um, your petroleum license, you get to an EPC with funding with a reputable company. Suddenly, the engagement changes, and you can sit down with these groups and say, we've done this, we've done this. This is what we're going to do over the next year or two. This is the group we're going to be working with. This is what we're going to be producing. We get a totally different response. And um, we could have gone a little bit earlier, but I believe that, you know, I've, I've said this before in some of the other um, interviews I've had, is this thing about credibility gaps. I think that you've got to close that credibility gap to a point where people believe that you can do it. And I believe we're there now. It's interesting um, because one of the questions further on is about the market. The market will wake up to this too at some stage. Um, Hopefully, the sooner the better. But certainly, the farmers, the grain growers, and the people in the ag industry have latched onto this very quickly as seeing this as a real alternative. I've definitely noticed that with my customers. And uh, one thing that keeps getting brought up, which uh, leads to another client's question, is uh, the urea price. Uh, when you did that feasibility study, what was the price then on the model that made the company at 30% IRR? To where the price is now, four hundred dollars. And, and what are we looking at at the moment? Oh, it depends on who you buy it from. Most of the farmers won't buy it because it's too expensive, but it's over seven hundred dollars. Yeah, incredible. It's, and, and they expect it will keep going up because there'll be a shortage of it. Um, if countries, you know, start locking down and keeping their own supplies and not exporting, it's going to get even more difficult, more expensive. Um, the Middle East, I said, most of us comes in from the Middle East and urea price has traditionally been attached to the price of natural gas because that's where the vast amount of urea comes from, is from that natural gas conversion. So you know, you're seeing a, a major concern uh, out there about that. But the views are, we've looked at long-term forecasting. We haven't done it, by the way. We've gone to the experts in the urea industry and, and um, on their forecasting. And the forecasting seems to be comfortable sitting around about $600 a tonne for you know, the near future. One of the great things about this is that our input costs don't change. You know, if you're buying gas from a producer, their costs move up over the next 20 to 30 years. So if you think you're going to be buying gas in 20 years' time at $10 a gigajoule, think again. You're going to be lucky if you're going to get it around the $15 to $20 in 10 years' time. We're still sitting at a dollar. No, because we make it ourselves, we make it at site. So we have that luxury that, you know, I hope it doesn't happen for the farmer's sake, but the higher the price goes, the greater the profit we have. We are not locked into buying it from overseas where that price moves and you only work on a margin. Our margin just keeps on increasing as the price goes up. So just in terms of margin, uh, 
if you're working on a million tons of urea per annum, so urea is around seven to eight hundred dollars a ton. What type of revenue do you be would you be expecting to get out of that? I think if you work on, you know, you're silly if you're going to do your numbers on the peak, right? So if it's setting seven or eight hundred dollars now, that's only a peak price that'll come back. So if you do your numbers on six hundred, which I'm pretty comfortable with, but you could even do them on five hundred if you're going to be, you know, a nervous Nelly or you're going to be negative on how we calculate profits and margins. If you sit back and say on revenue at five, um, five hundred dollars a ton, we're talking about revenue of five hundred million, right? You work out your metrics. Everyone knows how to work out the metrics on this. You know, you can either do it on revenue and you apply a multiple to the revenue stream, or if you're on profit, on profit it'll be about four hundred million a year, right? You can do a multiple on that profit. You know, you, you do obviously still have to pay state royalties, you have to pay tax, etc. But the multiple is based on your EBITs and your EBITDA. You can work it out. If we're making a four hundred dollar margin per ton then we've got a, a, and a million ton, we've got a four or 500 million um, profit stream sitting there. Uh, I always believe that 10 is probably a reasonable multiple. But you can, P of 10, yep. Well, you can go for a multiple of eight, I don't really care, but if we're doing 500 million, or we're doing 500 million profit in a year, you do an eight, that's 4 billion. Do your own numbers, you work through the shares that are actually issued. And clearly, if we have to issue a lot of shares to get to the next stage, it might be more dilution. Um, we Hopefully we don't have to. But if you work on that, you can work out pretty quickly what the share price should be, and then everyone just buys a discount to it. And that discount gets less and less as you get closer and closer to production. Those numbers are amazing. I'm sure everyone's got their calculators out at the moment, because I know I've already worked them out. Uh, I'll be holding for quite some time. Uh, just on some messaging, uh, now that the Koreans are locked in and a strategic di direction is more tangible, is it not time to try and get the message out to the investing public like we're doing today a little bit more so? I think, I think this is a, it's an interesting area. And the reason I think it's an interesting area is that people just sit back and think you're not doing this already. You know, we, we have probably three, four, five meetings a week. Tony has meetings nearly every day with different groups, depending on what their focus is. It's whether it's with the CFO or whether it's with me or whether it's with our MD. We were doing this all the time. But what I can say, and I've already alluded to this a bit earlier, is that the interest has completely changed, right? And that is that we're now perceived as a fertiliser company. We're not being perceived as a gas company. We're not being perceived as an energy company. And so we're having a look at a whole range of things that apply to this messaging. You know, do you look at things like rebranding? Do you look at things... Um, like, you know, making sure that you're called a fertiliser company, not necessarily an energy company. We're looking at all those issues at the moment because it's clear to us that if we keep pushing down this line of fertiliser rather than gas, we're getting a totally different response from ministers, from investors, from fund managers. Um, and I'm talking about the, the biggest ones in Australia are now talking to us and very seriously talking about us. It's actually taking them on, taking us on, sorry, as a client. Can I add in? We've gone to marketing companies about how to market. We've gone to PR companies about this. We've engaged some of the best. And I think that, you know, we've, we've had some issues in the past. I think that as a gas company, you're perceived as going up against Woodside, Santos, Origin, AGL. You know, it doesn't matter who it is. You're a minnow playing in the big market. So you're seeing as just simply potentially a, a takeover target rather than someone going into that market. When you're actually in the fertiliser section, if you think about that, from an Australian manufacturer of fertiliser, you're the only one outside of Incident Pivot at the moment that's moving forward as fast as we are. There are two other projects. You could argue three other projects in Australia. Um, we have done a fair bit of analysis on them and the people we talked to have done a lot of analysis on it. And we're pretty comfortable where we are, that even if they got up, they can't compete in price with us. So, um, as I said, we're looking at all those issues. And I think you were going to cut in then, Tony? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I was just going to add uh, two things, if I may. The focus of my efforts, uh, particularly with Justin and Phil Stavely, our MD, is talking to the fund managers. Since uh, November, when we got the production licence, and, uh, you know, just before that released the PFS numbers, the fund managers started, are starting to take us seriously. 
Um, so we're getting an opportunity to talk with them. And certainly the government reaction to the day limb announcement has been very strong because they can see this project maturing. For example, we met with the minister in South Australia for mining and energy last week. And he said to us, quote, your company has a record of doing everything my department has expected of us or meeting its expect uh, my department's expectations, end quote. So, you know, we are ticking some very significant milestones off and that is getting the attention uh, of the key stakeholders, particularly the funds. Uh, they're very keen to see how we're going to fund the 30%. Uh, we continue to talk with them. So, yeah, it's we, we are moving our marketing from retail uh, up to the, uh, what I say, out of retail land into the fund manager world. That's where the focus is. Thanks, Tony. Excellent. Uh, with the market, uh, obviously with the share price, the market's obviously sceptical uh, with Lee Creek's ability to get into production. What do they know that we don't? That Are they thinking this is a pipe dream? And I, do you think that this is achievable? All right, look, um, I'm highly critical of, of uh, Australian investment groups, I'm afraid. Uh, my time at Link, we, I raised over seven, eight hundred million dollars when I was at, with at Link. Nearly every dollar that was raised either in London, Hong Kong or New York. There was very little money raised in Australia. Initially, um, if you look at it, you, you say, what do they know that we don't know? I'd go the exact opposite of that. It's what they don't know. And a lot of them don't. You know, a lot of them really don't, in the past, haven't really been all that interested because I think you know, you, you've got to be realistic and understand that there is a legacy issue here with what happened in Queensland. When we first started from 2015, that was our first question. Every time we sat down, it was about link. It was about the environmental issues. Right? As we've ticked everything off, as the South Australian government distinguished, we were different because of these reasons. right? And they did their own documents and papers on it and their own technology reports on it to show why we were different to what happened in Queensland. I think another part of that was we didn't have this overlapping tenement issue where in South Australia, we were lucky enough that ISG UCG was done under a petroleum license, which we had. So there was no sort of competing issues, but you had it. So early on, we've had a lot of reticence from a lot of those fund managers who were investors in coal seam gas industry, who were well aware of what had gone on in Queensland with the publicity there. So that they just weren't going to give you the time. And some of them would take meetings, as we all know, that they'll take meetings to keep one of their mates happy who's asked them to take a meeting. And you'll sit there and have a meeting and the sort of questions you get will be silly. And I gave an example of one just recently that their comment was they didn't have confidence we had the ability within the company to build the plant. Um, well, they're dead right. But they obviously didn't read the announcements on Dalem. They obviously didn't look up who Dalem was, right? Because that's why we've employed them to do it. Um, so we've, we've had that issue. If you look at the markets, um, I get very, you know, you, you do these phone hookups, you do these interviews, you do your presentations, and you seem you know, reasonably calm and collected. Let me tell you, there are lots of times when I am not calm and collected over the share price, because I, I just, I sit there sometimes in disbelief at what it is and what I think it should be. And it's obviously a disconnect. It's obvious there's a disconnect there. But for those who've been with us for a fair while and know the meetings we've taken, who know the stories we're giving, who know the messages we're giving, that there's been this roadblock. I honestly believe that roadblock is gone. I think that we are now in this phase where as going down the area path and Dalem has changed that for us. Government ministers look at who Dalem is and don't question it because they have their own experts from Department of Trade from Korea who know Dalem and they have no issues. If you look at some of the fund managers we're now talking to, they don't even see us as a gas company anymore. They just see us as a fertiliser company and like that narrative. They see us as someone who's actually going to make sure that farmers in Australia are actually getting urea and fertiliser from Australia and there's no risk for them in supply chain and that there's a possibility of getting it at a cheaper price than what it's currently selling at. It's something I don't want to do, but I'll have to do it, I think. And that is, you know, you'll have to give some sort of discount, but it won't be much. All we've got to do is be cheaper than our competition. We don't have to cut the price down at any special price to get the product away. It's a commodity. Mm. So, so I think the market is changing. I know 
people get angry. I we cop the phone calls, and we cop the 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 yelling and the. It's not abuse. There's no abuse. I have to say most of the people that have been shareholders have been fantastic, but have been frustrated. But I can assure you, they haven't been any more frustrated than we have internally. That every time we tick that box and think we're moving forward, that we seem to get very little appreciation for it. So then people say, "Well, you're doing something wrong. You're not taking the right meetings. You're not selling the message right. You're not doing the right presentations." I can assure you that we don't do that right every time, but we do it right 80, 90 percent of the time. Certainly do. Uh, moving on to Indigenous environmental and COVID uh, issues. Uh, how are things going with some of the First Peoples who oppose the project? Um, <laughs> it's always a fluid issue. <laughs> um, so the Anamutla are the traditional owners within the area. Um, we have a cultural heritage agreement that we signed with them. Um, but as most people know, Atla are having their own challenges at the moment. Uh, they have their own issues they're dealing with. So um, the relationship, uh, it's not a homogenous group. So there are individuals within the group that we actually get on very well with. Um, up at site, we get on very well with them. There are some that, you know, the relationship is strained. But the great thing about the PPL, about the production licence, is that native title does not apply to it. So whilst we want to have that best relationship with the tradition, traditional owners, and whilst we've... Um, looking at employing them, want to work with them. Um, we are lucky that native title doesn't apply to that PPL. So therefore we don't run into any um, native title issues at the site. Okay, thank you. Uh, is an EIS approval required to conduct further drilling or has it already been approved? I read the recent announcement as Blue Box in December 21 as though it has already been approved, but suspect it is not. Um, so the EIS has been lodged for drilling um, we've already got approvals. The drilling component of it is just what's called an activity notification. Um, we have to lodge documents or paperwork with the government to show how we're going to drill um, and the safety procedures, the environmental procedures that go with that. And then the department approves that activity notification that allows us to drill. So you don't have to go through an EIS process for our drilling, for our seismic um, or for um, the base works. However, when we're talking about um, stage two, which is the, the commercial facility, we do have to submit one, but a lot of the information for that comes from the PCD that's already been done and feeds into from stage one. So once we do stage one, a lot of the information that comes from that feeds into the EIS um, and the EIR that's required for the project. Um, but as I said, we, we submitted our EIS for stage one, well, some time ago, it has been submitted. Um, and they've come back with a few issues in that. Um, also, we've referred, I noticed um, on a couple of the social um, sites that there was some question mark about the fact that, we, that the federal government, the EPA, were having a look at what we were doing. The reason they're having a look is we, we, we referred it to them. And that is that we decided that rather than go through a delayed process where one of them would come to us at a later date further along the path and ask questions about the project, um, that cut across their area, and there's not much that does cut across their area. We decided to refer it to the EPA in Canberra at an early stage and engage with them at an early stage so we weren't going to run into any roadblocks. We don't anticipate any roadblocks with the federal EPA at all on this. Um, for those of you who know the Lee Creek site, there's hardly um, any pristine areas. It's a highly disturbed site. Um, the location's been mined for 60 years, so we don't have any problems there either. Um, however, with stage two, with the state government, there are issues that um, we have to address in stage two that weren't addressed in stage one. An example of that would be the number of um, trains moving up and down the train line. What impact does that have on the environment and the local community? The number of people living in the town, what impact will that have on the hospital, on the police department, on the schools? Those sorts of issues have to be dealt with in, within that process on stage two, which we're working through at the moment. But they would have been addressed with the coal mine anyway previously. So it's yeah. not really game-changing type of stuff. It's not game-changing, but you've still got to do it. You've still got to go yeah. through the process and show that you've got it managed. Right? Can I just, have... May I add to that? The production licence that we received in November last year, if that's not world's first, it's definitely Australia's first. It was groundbreaking. The rest of the approvals that we uh, need from here on are duplications with modifications, or they're through the Development Act, which every 
state in Australia operates every day uh, with, and um, those are not groundbreaking. And that's why I believe the fund managers have taken notice because we achieved something that they didn't think we would get, and that's the, the production license. So um, yeah, we've got, we've got approvals to come, but they're not um, like the PPL, which was, was a, I, I guess there's a bit of risk with it, but we, we managed that risk and covered that risk very well. And that's why we achieved uh, what we did with the grant of that license. Thanks, Tony. Uh, conscious of time, there's only a few questions left. Uh, Justin, you touched on this one earlier, saying that the uh, contracts overseas, uh, the people you're dealing with or the corporations, I would rather say, want to meet with you face to face. Uh, have you been speaking with the government about getting exemptions, COVID shots, those types of things? Um, so yeah, so the Department of Trade and Commerce in South Australia have been working with us on several issues. So getting an exemption to leave Australia is not that difficult if you um, have a, a substantial reason or if you're a film star or an actor, and I'm not neither of those two, so it has to be a substantial reason. That's not the issue. If you're going into a country, um, you know, if you're going into China, it's very difficult at the moment, by the way, but if you're going to Korea or Japan or the US, you've got to show that you've been vaccinated. So on that point, um, several of us have already had the first jab of the AZ and um, affected us differently for those who've had it done, but we've had it done for a reason. And that is that we then are not a long way off getting the second one. You then have to wait 12 days after that second one before you're allowed to enter into some of these countries. Um, so we are doing that very actively at the moment for the obvious reason of face-to-face -face meetings with the people we need to meet with. Excellent. Uh, other parts of Lee Creek's business, the Cooper Basin permits. Uh, I know Dale lim has been the big focus for the business for quite some time. You've done extremely well getting to where you've gone. Uh, just wondering on some follow-up there for investors. So we've got two, we've got two projects um, outside of the um, ISG one at Lee Creek. We've got the joint venture with Bridgeport. Um, that's going well. The, we expect an announcement on the progress of that very soon. We've been waiting um, on one party to um, contribute to that. I don't mean financial, I mean contribute to the announcement on where that one's going but that one's going in a very positive direction. The other one was the granting of the two licenses in the Cooper Basin. Uh, we're expecting an announcement on that very, very soon. Um, one, well, I can say we believe it's imminent, um, but that, that required a couple of things to be done from the government side and for us to work with the traditional owners in the Cooper Basin. And by the way, it's not a difficult process um, because it's already done by all the companies in the Cooper and it's basically a a cookie cutter process of going through to get that, that, but we have completed all that. So we're expecting some good news to be able to give the market on that one very soon. Right. Uh, Justin, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time and Tony and Lee Creek for sparing you today. That uh, list of accomplishments that you put up at the beginning and what you're working on at the moment, uh, we believe is very, very fantastic. I really have to congratulate you for what you've achieved in a period of time against all the odds, especially the PPL getting that so soon. I think as we've discussed privately, I think that was a, one of the riskiest uh, things that you had to overcome. And I'm just very impressed with where you are today. Uh, I'm obviously still invested, trying to let my wife buy, being able to buy some more shares. She's sort of put the reins in because I've gone on quite heavily for our personal portfolio. But uh, I guess we're really looking forward over the next quarter to hopefully seeing some updates with your funding and strategic partners. Uh, I know everyone who I've been speaking to recently is looking forward to hearing things. Tony's been very positive. He's done very well at keeping us informed, as have you. And I really, as I said, thank you for doing this. And it must be exhausting. What drives you guys? Like it's, was, you're always I pushing I up you. I don't want to swear, but it's, you, you've I, got it's against funny. the odds. It's funny, Tony and I have often made this comment and Phil has made the comment that occasionally you'd like a nice easy break in there rather than having to work so hard to get everything done. It'd be nice to have an easy break. I guess it's the nature of where we are, ISG and fossil fuels, you know, um, with um, traditional owner issues becoming more front and centre around Australia and mining sites and that. You know, we've had a lot of challenges on the way, but um, one of the things that was asked there was what pushes me, what motivates me for this? And it's pretty straightforward. There's a few of them. The first is that I find it really important to support our loyal shareholders. Um, 
probably too much so. And I know Tony and, and Phil are the same, is that we feel it very personally. Um, so we want to support them. And the way we support our loyal shareholders is by making lots of money. I mean, that's the bottom line. We're all in this to make a lot of money. I have a total belief that going down the area path, it was the right move. I could see this back in 2012 before we even went down this path that urea was one of the ways we could go because of my family involved in farming. Um, I think that's incredibly important and I'm excited about the fact that that is the right decision we've made and it's the right path we're going down. Um, so I, that's another one that motivates me. Self-sufficiency for Australian urea. Yeah, that, that's, that's important, but that's not my driver. It's probably the driver of a lot of the farmers I know, but it's not mine. And I think the greatest driver for me is I think the greatest form of revenge is success and that is for all the naysayers all the people that said we wouldn't get where we got to today and there's been a lot of them um, rather than being bitter rather than I told you so the greatest told you so is success right and the way you get that success is stickability you just stay in there and you keep swinging so one of my very close friends in New York said to me so this is a 15 round bout he said, you don't win this race. You don't win this fight in round one. This is 15 rounds and you just keep going one round at a time, which is what we've done. And if you sat back at the start and said, these are all the issues you've got to get through, we probably wouldn't have done it. You know, ignorance is helpful sometimes, but in hindsight, yeah. in hindsight, what we've achieved is made. So stickability is there. I just want success. I want success personally for the, for the work we've all done. I want success for our people in the company that have been with us. And I want success for our shareholders. Just on a last note, which is a question from me, because I'm always, I'm a trader. Obviously, trade options, derivatives, a lot of things for my investors. Have you got any comments on timeline over the next quarter? Is there anything we should be expecting that should help this share price to get those institutions investing? Uh, is there anything we can look forward to in this quarter? We, you, you've got to be careful on this one. I mean, I've got to be very careful to say anyway, but. Everyone knows that you come out with a major announcement, right? And that major announcement, you might see that share price uh, spike. And then if you don't keep the market informed on a regular basis after that, you see it drifting again, right? So what we've got to do is make sure that we're informing the market of the pro progress we're making. Well, the important one at the moment is the progress on the work with Dalian. So you saw that today with an announcement on Dalian that you know, they've taken the first step. And what we need to do is keep going through that with the BFS and with the feed and where we are in the feed. So people can see we're actually moving forward. This is not, you know, smoke and mirrors. We are moving forward on this. Um, within that, I expect some other major announcements, um, you know, in the next. Now, now, Tony will hit me over the head if I say anything too um, optimistic, but I'll say, you know, we expect some big announcements coming through on some major issues. And there aren't a lot of major issues left that need to be ticked, by the way. Um, in the near future. Now, you know, I would like it where tomorrow, it could be any time you know, in the next few months, but we're working on that daily. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to actually coming up with some great announcements and, that, and hopefully the market finally wakes up. Justin, I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time and uh, Tony as well. Uh, that's been very enlightening. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to talk to you one on one. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for giving us your time today, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Everyone. Thank you.